Hello and welcome back to CS128 Honors. In this lesson video, we're going to talk about ownership in Rust and specifically how it works with functions. So to recap Eustace's video, each uh, variable in Rust has another variable that's called its owner. And there can only be one owner for each variable at a time. And when that owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. And so these are the three rules of ownership. And so building upon that, all scalar types are copied by value by default. And this means that ownership practically doesn't apply to scalar types unless you're actively trying to make it. And then finally, ownership rules apply to values that are stored on the heap, which are variable size. So let's talk about ownership and functions. So in Rust, functions take ownership of var variables by default. And what does this look like practically? Well, if we take a look at this code here, and on the right hand side, we have a little simplified version of memory, right? So when we start up the code and run this first line, we're going to allocate some space on the stack in the heap. And so specifically, we're going to create uh, this variable s, and we're going to have a length, a capacity, and then a pointer to some variable size memory, in this case, a string in the heap. And the heap is essentially memory that can be expanded and shrunk at any time. And so in this case, we're putting hello in there, and we have the s variable on our stack. Then when we run this next line, print string s, we're going to create a separate part of the stack uh, for print string. And so this is not going to be accessible by main, and it will go away once print string is done. But in the meantime, it will be there. And so when we go into print string, what's happening here is the function is taking ownership. And so what that means is it's going to move the owner, all of the values from s into this new variable called some string and s is no longer going to have an owner and it's going to be marked invalid. And so now inside here, some string can now be used to print out and in this case it would print out hello, but that's all that's going to happen. And so once this is done, once we go back up to the next line in main, all this memory in the stack for print string is going to get deallocated. And what that looks like is it's going to remove everything and s will remain invalid. And so this is problematic because if we wanted to say add a print string below, now s is no longer valid and we don't have hello in there. And that's what happens here is you'll get a compiler error telling you, hey, you can't do that anymore because it's already been moved. So is all hope lost? No. There is a way to sort of get around this. And the biggest part of that is that functions can give ownership just like they can take it. And so if we look at this example, we're using shadowing to say, we're going to set s to be the result of print string s. And inside print string, we return the string with its ownership once we're done. And so this would look just like the example from before, but instead when the stack deallocates, it gets moved back into s. And so one thing to note here, though, is that this can get really, really messy really, really fast when passing many, many variables around, right? If you have some sort of struct that has like 15 strings or something, and you need to start passing that around, that's going to get very annoying. So there is another way that's going to be even better than this. And if we had to do this every time, nobody would be writing Rust code, right? So let's talk about borrowing. Borrowing is the idea that you can temporarily use a variable in Rust without taking ownership of it. And borrowing is accomplished by referencing that variable. And to reference, all you have to do is use the ampersand. And taking a look at an example of this, Let's go back to that code that wouldn't compile where we were trying to print hello twice. And all we have to do is add ampersands. And now this code will compile and it will print hello five hello. And so the reason this is working is because what we're doing is we're giving the compiler s, but we're actually passing s over. And so what's happening is instead of actually taking ownership, it says, hey, give this back to me when I'm done. And so print string will take it, it will use it, and then it will give it back to s. And this way, you're not going to have a bunch of issues where ownership goes away. Now, it's also possible to make a borrowed variable uh, using mutable. And so if you look at this, right, if you have a mutable variable and you want to make a borrowed reference, then you can borrow using the and mute. And now you can instead change it and say, I uh, like add something to it. So in this case, we have some string and we're pushing to that string with world. And so the output for this is going to be hello and then hello world. Because the first one, we have our print string function, which takes it, it prints it. And then because it's a mutable borrow, it will push world to it. 
and then return ownership back to S, and then S is printed out after that. Now, there is one catch with borrowing, and that is that borrowed variables have one rule, which is that you can either have unlimited immutable borrowed variables where you cannot change the value, or one mutable borrowed variable, right? Because we don't want to have many mutable borrowed variables because then that creates race conditions when you have threads. So the idea here is you can have many uh, immutable variables and that way only one owner and in reality it won't change from that borrowed variable. Or you can change it but then you can't have anything else looking at it at the same time. And so yeah, as I said, you can't have both. So taking a look at this example, we now have a, a string called s, and we do string from hello, and we have three variables. We have r1, r2, and r3, and so these are all references to s. And so the first two work fine, but then the third one becomes a big problem because we already have two immutable references, and we're trying to make a mutable reference, right? We can't borrow mutable when we're borrowing immutably. So in this case, this wouldn't compile. But if we move that code below, it's no longer a problem. And so the reason for this, you might be confused, like we still have those immutable variables. Not actually. In reality, what's going on is that R1 and R2 are going out of scope. The Rust compiler notices that R1 and R2 are not being used after that line. And so after that print statement, both of those get freed from memory and are no longer valid. And so at that point, R3 goes and is able to make a mutable reference to it. So let's talk about dereferencing and that should make this make a little more sense. So as I said, when you have S1, which is variable, and you try to take a reference of it, which is borrowing, then you're basically saying, hey, I'm going to take S1, here's where S1 is, right? And so this way you're able to still access all of the underlying data, but you know that you're one level above. Now, sometimes you actually want to be operating from the level of S1 because you want to modify something or something else like that. And so if you look at this code, for example, I took a reference to an I32, so I'm borrowing a integer. And in this case, I need to actually dereference it to be able to modify the integer and make sure that I'm not modifying the reference itself. And so in this case, all I'm doing is I'm dereferencing the int, making it go up by five and then printing it out, which in this case will print out 10. So why didn't we have to do all this before? Well, the answer is because in some cases, the Rust compiler is already doing this for you, right? You don't have to worry about it because Rust has a good compiler that is able to sort of infer sometimes you want to do this. So you might also be wondering, why are we doing all this, right? Why can't I go back to Java where all you have to do is create new variables and it just works out of the box? Well, the answer to that is let's take a look at what Java and C++ do and then we'll compare it to Rust. So Java uses what's called a garbage collector. And what's nice about that is that it'll periodically go around the entire system and check if any memory is still being used. Uh, and if it's not, then it'll get rid of it. And so this is an automatic memory management system, which is great because it means that we don't have to care how the memory is being used because once we're done with it, Java will figure it out and delete it for us. However, the drawback is that this is incredibly slow, right? To have the CPU going around, checking all the memory and seeing if it's still being used takes a lot of time that could be spent working on actual computation. So that's why Java can be a little bit slower than say C++ or C. Now on the other end, you have C++ where you'll have programmers manually allocating and freeing memory, right? And you'll see this in a couple weeks in CS128 where you actually have to tell C++, hey, here's some memory, I need this much and I want to do this with it, right? and C++ will go and do that, and that's all you have to worry about with it. But it means that there's a good chance for a human error, right? You might forget to free some memory, you might forget to allocate enough memory. There's all kinds of different small little mistakes that you can make when working with memory in C++ that then become problems later on. And so as a result, it's prone to human error. And the upside though is that it means that the system can focus on only running the code that's necessary, and that way, it's gonna run much, much faster than Java will. So as you can see with these two uh, cases, both of them have positives and negatives. What Rust tries to do is it tries to bridge the gap in between. So Rust has the compiler automatically insert memory allocations and freeze for you. And it does this by inferring when you need them and when you don't and when you're borrowing and so on. 
And so it handles all the memory management for you. And so it's still automatic in a way, but it requires a little bit more work than Java because it's not technically automatic, right? It's still being done at the code level. It's just the compiler is doing this for you as opposed to you having to manually do it. And this means that the system can still focus on actually running code and it's fast, but it's not prone to human errors like in C++. And so this is a little chart that we've shown for the past few semesters is that you have sort of different languages and they have this sort of idea of control and performance in terms of how fast you can make them go versus safety and how safe they are to work with, right? So on the one end you have C or C++ where it's very, very fast, but you're also going to have to be very, very careful about what you're working with. However, on the other end you have languages like Go or Java or Haskell, which are much safer, but are giving up some of that speed and performance that you would otherwise have with C or C++. And so Rust, because of its smart compiler, is able to sort of bridge that gap in between the two and have both a really fast language that still has a lot of safety thanks to the comp compilation features. So in this lesson video, we talked about ownership and functions, specifically how functions can give or receive ownership and then how we can borrow instead of giving and receiving ownership so that we can avoid having to return all of our variables all the time. We then talked about dereferencing and how you can use dereferencing to get the underlying values of variables that are borrowed. And then we also talked about manual memory management and why we need to do it for something like Rust or C++ versus a language like Java. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I have for ownership for this week. In the next lesson video, Eustace is going to give some examples of ownership and work through them with you, as well as talk about slices. So have fun with that.